Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos. Normally our videos are to help you play chess better, but I thought I'd do one a little bit different this time. Uh, I'm getting up there in age a little bit, and I was thinking about my chess legacy. You know, what have I done in the chess world? And I thought it'd be interesting to make a video. I came up with a, a list of like 15 different hats that I've had, and I thought I'd just show some of them and talk about a little bit about them. So let's start with the most obvious one. I, for the last quarter century, I've been a chess instructor. It's been my full-time job. You know, I teach people six, seven days a week. Uh, I teach people of all different levels. I teach beginners. I teach people who are already at expert and master level. I teach uh, young people. I teach older people. A lot of my students these days are uh, intermediate adults but I really teach about everybody and I've been doing it for 25 years and I guess that's kind of in a sense what I kind of identify myself as. Well, what else am I? Well, I'm certainly a chess author. You've probably seen my books. If we go to my website, let's do a quick peek over there. Uh, Dan Heisman, Dan's books. There they are. We got 12 books real quickly. A Parent's Guide to Chess, Elements of Positional Evaluation, which is the first book which I wrote on a typewriter, uh, I hate to tell, say it, 47 years ago. The Improving Annotator, Looking for Trouble, The Traxler Counterattack, The Computer Analyzes, The Fried Liver and the Lolly, Everyone's Second Chess Book, Back to Basics Tactics, The Improving Chess Thinker, A Guide to Chess Improvement, The World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book, and Is Your Move Safe? So 12 chess books, my third thing that I've done, and we can see it a little bit over here, is as a columnist for about, uh, let's see how long, I guess about a dozen years, I wrote the Novice Nook column for Chess Cafe. And that contains a lot of my best stuff. And we see some of the highlights of that in that one book, A Guide to Chess Improvement. But I also have written lots of stuff for chess.com and other places, so I have some of them here my Novice Nook column, which my links no longer work here because Chess Cafe is now a paid site. Chess.com articles, you can see a whole bunch of blogs, a whole bunch of articles. So, columnist, yes, for sure. Okay, uh, what else? Radio host. Well, back in 2000, 2001, there was a thing called Chess FM, which was running on ICC, and the gentleman who ran the station, his name was Tony Rook. Obviously a made-up chess name, but that's okay. And I contacted Tony Rook and I said, Hey, Tony, you know, I may, may not be the most famous uh, chess master around, but uh, I know a lot about a lot of different things. I've written books. I work with the computer chess people. I teach people. Um, I do things on openings. I said, I'm a, I know a little bit about everything. I work with the rules committee. I'm a tournament director. I can answer questions about history of chess. Why don't we create a, a radio show and I'll answer people's questions? So Tony said, okay, and we decided to call it Ask the Renaissance Man because Renaissance Man is sort of like someone who's jack of all trades can do and will do everything. And so I kind of called myself the Renaissance Man and we had a radio show for like eight, nine years. And after that, the ICC asked me to start doing videos and I did about 400 videos for them. Then I worked for Chess.com as a TV host. So we had Chess.com's TV, and for a couple years I did uh, a similar show, a question and answer show on their television. And the name of that show was Q&A with Coach Heisman, which I think they still have some of those archived. So that's another hat that I had. Of course, originally I started out as a player. What kind of player was I? Well, in those days the ratings were a lot, lot lower than they are now. Now it's really easy to become an expert and certainly a lot easier to become a master than it was 50, 60 years ago. Um, I never thought I could become a master. Every, the only people who are masters are people who quit their jobs and were full-time chess players, and that wasn't going to be me. And I didn't start till I was 16 years old. And one of the first things I found out when I started playing tournament chess when I was 16 was A, I was terrible. If you saw the first games I played in my first three tournaments, I was completely unrecognizable. And the second thing is Bobby Fischer became U.S. champion when he was 14, and by the time he was 16, he was two-time, three-time U.S. champion. 
and I was about to go into my junior year in high school and then go to college. And, you know, I wasn't going to be an international chess player. I was just happy if I could not be, be, you know, just another guy. I wanted to be someone who at least the other players respected. So that was kind of my goals, be, you know, get to be a respected chess player. And it wasn't until my fourth tournament that people actually thought that I was even playing anything resembling reasonable chess. So, but I improved very, very quickly. And within three years, when I was 19, 20, I made the US top 25 chess list for juniors. So I was one of the top 25 juniors in the United States. In those days, you didn't need to be, have as high a rating as now. If you were in the top 25 juniors today, you'd have to have a rating like over 2,400. In those days, the top junior in the whole United States was Jim Tarjan, who was soon to be one of the top three or four grandmasters in the United States. And I think his rating was 2384. So the number one junior, when I was in the top 25 list, had a rating low enough that it wouldn't make the top 25 today. And that's not to say Jimmy Tarjan wouldn't be in the top 25. He would be one of the top ones today. It's just that the ratings are higher today. So Jimmy Tarjan had a 2384 rating then. He probably would have a more like a 2584 rating, you know, if it was today. So I was a pretty good player. I made the top 25 junior list, but I never really played that much actively. And in my entire life, I only have about 350 USCF rated games, even though I'm a master. And as Jay Bonin once said to me, I play that many every six months. <laughs> so I didn't have a very long career, but I think I did really, really well in my short career. And I've shown you in our some of the videos, some of the games that I played. Uh, let's take a look at the ending of a game I played against a pretty well-known player, another of the top juniors at the time. Later on, my opponent, John Peters, became the columnist for the Los Angeles Times, and I think he was the, their columnist, chess columnist, for like 40 years. So I was playing John Peters at the Merrimack Grand Prix in 1969. John was already a hot up-and-coming superstar, and I was kind of a nobody, but uh, I, I had did my, have my rating up near expert at the time. And let's take a look at the end of the game. John was white, and he has more space, but his e-pawn is both strong because it's passed on e6, but it's also a little bit weak because it's, it can't easily be guarded. So I played rook a d8, attacking the knight. And the problem is, John can't guard it with the rook, and he can't, he can't play rook c4, rook d6. I think I can play rook takes d6, queen takes d6, rook d8, skewering the queen and the knight. So for those of you that can't visualize, rook here, I think I can play rook takes, queen takes, rook here, and win the knight. Um, he can't play rook c4 and guard the knight, but if he moves the knight, then he loses the pawn. So he has to move the knight. He brings it back, and I say, thank you, thank you, thank you for the pawn, also simultaneously guarding my a pawn. And John says, well, I'm losing. I don't want to trade. I attack his queen. He goes back. I double my rooks. He plays knight g5. Now Stockfish says I should allow him to check me with the knight. Stockfish says I should play bishop e5. Let's let Stockfish 12 show you this. Stockfish 12. Uh, Stockfish 12 says bishop e5. Knight f7 check. Queen f7. Rook f7. Bishop takes g3. H takes g3. Rook on 40 e7 and black should be winning. Um, so bishop e5 would be a nice move there. All right, so I don't play that. By the way, by the th this game was played, I think, at a time limit of 50 moves in two hours. And we're already around move 38 or 39, and we're both really short on time. In fact, this game featured a famous little conversation while we're in time trouble. At one point around here, I said to John, I said, in my short time left, I offer you a draw. And John looked around the board real fast, and he looked up at me, and he said, in my short time left, I decline. So... So uh, I played rook back. We traded rooks. John brought his queen down to d6, hitting my rook and my a pawn. I bring my rook, my queen to e8, threatening rook e1 check with mate and another. John blocks the mate with knight f3. I play rook to e3. I guess in some lines I can take the knight. Probably not. John plays queen to c7, and now he's got some threats, which I don't see in time trouble. 
And I play rook there. I think the computer says I should have taken that second pawn and hit the rook right away. I thought the pawn might be poison, but it turns out I, I really need to win it now. I t attack the pawn a second time, and now what John should do is play queen to b7. Let's ask Stockfish. Stockfish, what should white play? Queen to b7. And now he's threatening rook to c8, and I don't have time to sack my rook and get a mate because once he take, I can't take back because my queen would be pinned. So I have to play a silly move like bishop here to stop rook c8, and now he has time to take the pawn with an equal game. So instead, John, instead of putting the queen on b7, he puts his queen on b6. And I say, all right, maybe I should take that pawn now, which is the best move. John aggressively plays rook to c7. I just bring the bishop back, covering the second rank. And John mistakenly, with his flag hanging, takes the pawn. And I look at the board and I think, you can't do that. Rook checks. He can't take with a knight because queen takes his mate. He puts the knight in the way, but now the queen's not guarding that square anymore. So I sacrifice my rook for the knight. Rook takes g1 check. And with mate on the next move, jack resigns. King takes g1, queen e1, mate. So I was exhausted and I sat back in my chair and a couple of my friends came over and they say, how'd you do? And I said, I won. And they went, you won? Because, you know, they knew I was playing one of the top juniors in the country. And I said, yeah, and I started to explain what was going on and all of a sudden I stopped and I realized this was the game I needed to get my rating over 2000, which was one of my life goals. And in, as I said, in those days, that was a really, really big accomplishment. And I sat back in my chair all of a sudden and I interrupted myself and I said, I'm an expert. <laughs> so that was the game where I got my expert title. Okay, uh, what else have I been? Well, I've been a problemist. We already saw um, one of my top columns, one of my top problems in another video. I won't show you the solution but it's white to play and win. So if you want to see the answer, you can give it to the computer or you can go back and watch the earlier video where I explain it all in detail. I have lots of other problems that I've created. Let's bring up a couple more. Um, I've done some, I've done some uh, helpmates. So let's do this one. Okay, this is kind of a humorous one. Help made in two. A help made in two is where black moves first, then white moves, then black moves, then white moves, and black is trying to help white checkmate him. So here, black has to move first and help white checkmate on the second move. I'll show you the answer. If you don't want to see the answer, you can pause the video and try to solve it yourself, or you can skip over the answer. But the answer is the only move that black can play that'll work is to push the pawn to the eighth rank and get a bishop. White has to play his pawn up to g8, and he has to get a bishop. Black has to block his escape square, square with the bishop. And now white plays checkmate. bishop e6, checkmate. So it's, that's the only solution. White to, sorry, black to play and help white checkmate in two. Let's do another helpmate. This one's a little bit harder. Black to play and help white checkmate him in three moves. So again, if you want to try it, pause the video. Black to play. Black's going, we're going to do black, then white, then black, then white, then black, then white checkmates. All right, what's the answer? It looks easy once, everything's easy once you see the answer. But the right answer is rook f6. White plays c8 and gets a knight. Black plays king to F, f5, white plays king to d5, black plays knight to g4, and white plays checkmate. 97, as the computer says, checkmate. Okay, so I'm a problemist. What else am I? Well, I've done opening theory. I've had my work published in uh, New and Chess Magazine. One of the things I found was I was studying whether or not, let's create a board here. Um, I was studying whether or not the fried liver was stronger than the lolly using a computer. I wrote a couple books on 
the Traxler counterattack. The Traxler counterattack. I, I read a couple books on two knights' defense. The first one was on the Traxler counterattack. What's the Traxler counterattack? It's the line where black plays bishop c5 instead of the main line d5. And the question is, does either side have a forced win? For instance, if white plays knight takes and black plays bishop takes f2 check, can white win this position? So I spent about, I don't know, six months staying up till 2 in the morning analyzing this with the computer, and I made a CD on this called The Computer Analyzes the Traxler. If I printed out the whole CD and made it into a book, it would be about a thousand pages. So I spent a lot, of, a lot of my life working on this problem. The other problem I worked on, as I said, was is the fried liver attack better than the lolly? So what are the fried liver and the lolly? If black plays d5, e takes d5, black's supposed to play knight a5. Suppose black makes a mistake and plays knight takes d5. White has two moves. He could play d4. Or he can play knight takes f7. Knight takes f7 is the famous fried liver attack. After king takes, queen f3 check, king e6, knight c3, knight on 5 to b4. Computers are now finding the white should either castle or play bishop b3 here. Those weren't the moves originally that were thought to be the best. But now that we have computers, we know more. Well, it was thought for a while that the lolly was even better. You play d4, and if he plays bishop e7 hitting the knight, now you sacrifice, and you get an improved version of the, of the fried liver attack. That's called the lolly. But black doesn't have to play bishop e7. And what I found was maybe black had a chance to equalize in the lolly if he plays knight d4, c3. Let's turn on the engine here. And now black can play the crazy move b5, bishop d3, h6. And now originally I was playing something like queen h5 here. And you can see Stockfish likes queen h5. But queen h5 seems to lead toward a, an equal position. Um, as it looks deeper, maybe that number will come down. Let's, For instance, queen h5, he should take, take and then play e4, and now you see the number is close to zero. Black has good compensation for the exchange. But instead, recently, a few years ago, I found knight, sorry, instead of queen h5, knight takes f7, king takes f7, c takes d4, bishop checks, bishop d2, bishop takes, knight takes, and now no matter what black plays, white can pretty much force an endgame where white's up a pawn. It, it doesn't look like it from this position, but give it to your computer. And I asked Larry Kaufman, Grandmaster Kaufman, who does a lot of work with Komodo, and I said, Larry, I think this line might be close to winning for white. I think this line's just as good as the main line and the fried liver attack. And Larry was nice enough to, me to answer me and say, yeah, Dan, I think, uh, I think that white's much better here. So, uh, you know, I, when I originally wrote this article on the like the, the line with queen takes h8, I sent it into New and Chess Magazine. Uh, sorry, not New and Chess Magazine, New and Chess Yearbook, which is also run by New and Chess Magazine. And they published the article. And we talked a lot about the fried liver lolly. And also, uh, I've had several mentions in that in the New and Chess uh, Yearbook about my uh, Traxler counterattack video. Okay, what else have I done? Well, I was a USCF tournament director for, oh gee, 40 years. Uh, I became a senior tournament director. I ran, gotta be, gotta be a, over 100 tournaments. I started out running little Heisman invitationals for friends of mine and worked my way up to be a senior tournament director. I worked as a assistant at some of the World Opens. Uh, I ran the Scholastic Championships for Pennsylvania for a few years. In fact, not only did I have my hat as a tournament director, but I took over the job as the Pennsylvania State Scholastic Coordinator for a few years, and I organized the tournament, which features like, you know, 500, 600 kids playing um, every year at the state championship. So I had to completely organize that, that tournament and run it. So that was another hat, the Scholastic Coordinator. 
We also know my, my hat as a charity organizer for um, chess tournaments. We have the Holly Heisman Memorial, which I created, which raises funds for women in need. So I'm proud to say that my organizer hat includes the charity tournament for you know getting donations for the Philadelphia Foundation for our Holly Heisman uh, Fund, which helps women in need. Another one of my hats is a chess club officer. First, I was president of the Chaturanga Chess Club. Then I became an officer, like activities coordinator for the Mainline Chess Club. I, I still give seminars at, uh, like every third Tuesday on Tuesday nights for the Mainline Chess Club. I have a hat in computer chess. For many, many years, I was a member of the International Computer Chess Association, now called the International Computer Game Association. Uh, in, in that capacity, I worked at both the Kasparov Deep Blue matches. I published a couple things in the ICC, ICCA Bulletin. Um, nothing of importance. I went to the U.S. Computer Chess Championship. I think it was the last one that was ever held in Cape May, New Jersey in 1996, maybe. And I spent a weekend hanging out there with all the top computer programmers, uh, talking with them because my... This is giving chess is my third career. My first career was a software engineer and manager, so that's how I knew the software side of things. My second career was as an investment advisor in Pennsylvania, and now teaching chess. So I have that hat of being a chess master and also of being on the software side of things. So I kind of got in with the crowd of the uh, computer chess people. Um, let's see here. What else? Well, we have oh and. Uh, I, we have my Danisms. I have things that I've said and written. I was reading a book written by a young international master a couple years ago, and I turned the page, and he had a, it was an opening book, and I didn't expect this, but he had a page, and he had a quote, and he said, think of a draw offer as an offer to remain ignorant of what you would have learned for the rest of the game. And I said, I recognize that quote, and of course he gave me credit. He said, this is a quote from Dan Heisman. So... I get these quotes out there. I have a book called The Wisest Things Ever Said About Chess by Andy Soltis, and I'm happy to say that two of the things that I've said made his book. Uh, when Lev Albert wrote his book, Chess Rules of Thumb, he also had one or two things that I've said in there. So it's nice that I've had some recognition for things. I say things like, you can't play what you don't see. That's one of my favorites. Uh, we just talked about think of a draw offer as remain ignorant. Um, Oh, I don't know. I got, <laughs> I've got so many of them that it's hard to say. Probably what I'm most famous for, and I had a video earlier on this, is, is Hope Chess. And it's funny because I get credit for something that I didn't do, which is I came up with the first published idea of Hope Chess and I talked about it. But people think I meant anything you can hope for in a chess game. Like, for instance, you make a thread and you hope your opponent doesn't see it. Or you make a bad move and you hope your opponent doesn't take advantage of it. Or you try a stupid strategy and you hope that it works. Those were never any of the things that I meant when I meant hope chess. But now when I hear about those things, people say, oh, you're just playing hope chess. That's what that's that what thing that Dan Eisman created. And really, that wasn't what I meant. I, I was only meaning hope chess to mean you make a move without checking to see if it's safe. In other words... You make a move and you don't look for your opponent's checks, captures, and threats in reply. And you have to make sure that if he makes a check, capture, or threat, that you have a safe way of meeting it. If you don't, and there is, you're just lucky. But that's not how good players play. They, 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 they look at a candidate move and they say, if I make this move and my opponent makes a check, capture, threat, what am I going to do? If they can't find an answer, then they discard that move. But weaker players don't do that. They make a move without looking at a check, capture, or threat, and then when their opponent makes a, a threat, they go, uh-oh, what am I going to do about this? Well, if they can do something, they're lucky, and if they can't, then they're out of luck and the game's over. But that I call hope chess because when the opponent makes the threat, then they're hoping they can meet it. Good players don't play that way. Good players don't hope they can meet it. They already know they can meet it or they wouldn't have made that move to begin with. So that's what I meant by hope chess, but... I've gotten a lot of publicity out of people saying hope chess is like when people do silly things and then they hope that it works. Well, that was never my intention, and I've said that a million times, but I guess I can't uh, complain too much. I'll take the, uh, take the good with the bad, so to speak, and uh, I'll say, okay, if that helps them remember me, uh, I'll be Mr. Hope Chess. 
Finally, there's one more legacy that I have. What is it? Well, you're looking at it right here. My, my last legacy is after I stopped doing my videos for ICC, 400 videos there, I said, well, let me open up my book and, you know, let's do videos, completely new videos for everybody in the world. Where can I do that? Well, I can use the same kind of technology I was using for my ICC videos, but I'll create my own YouTube channel. So I created my YouTube channel and I have been, this is I think my 160th video covering almost every area of chess improvement. So my YouTube channel has been another one of my hats for um, my chess legacy where you guys can look up and say, what, what does Dan say about openings? How about learning openings? Which, how, about, how about which openings should I pick? How about how I learn to analyze better? What is... How do I evaluate positions? How do I analyze them better? How do I improve my visualization? What kind of people should I be playing? Uh, how often should I play? What book should I read? You know, these are all things that we see from my channel. So hopefully they have been helping people. And, and one last mention is I've been doing a chess tip of the day on Twitter since 2009. If, you, if I've missed about 10% of the days, that's still over 3,000 chess tips of the day. And occasionally I have ones like, you know, you can't play what you don't see. And I'll do that maybe once a year. So I will repeat some of them. But a lot of them are completely new that I've never done before. So I would say out of the 3,000 plus chess tips of the day, there's probably got to be at least 1,500 unique ones that I put out there that are tips. And you can just go to Dan Heisman, at Dan Heisman on Twitter, and you can look at my history there. And you could read chess tips if you read... You know, a hundred a day, it would take you over a month to read all my chess tips of the day. So that's another hat I have, maybe a 16th hat, the chess tip of the day guy on Twitter. Okay, so I think I've left a pretty good legacy, and hopefully I'm not done. Uh, they say, you know, 70 is the new 50 or something, who knows. And hopefully I can stay healthy and keep making videos for you and chess tips of the day and teaching everybody six days a week. It's been my pleasure. I like to help people. I think that's, anytime someone becomes a teacher, I think that's obvious that that's what they like to do. They like to help people. And, uh, you know, for anybody who's taking lessons from me, you know I'm not a monotonic chess teacher. I'll go, oh, what was that? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Or, oh, that wasn't so good. Or, wow, that was interesting. Oh, yeah, good move. Okay, well, not so bad. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a monotonic chess teacher. I'm, I really uh, get into it a lot. And, so you have to be, you have to have the chemistry for that kind of thing, but that's okay. Um, you know, I try to please as many people as I can, but you can't please everyone. Okay, I hope you enjoyed today's video on my chess legacy. Uh, and please uh, tell your friends about my channel. And if you want to subscribe, great, hit the subscribe button. If you like this video, hit the like button. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.